Assalamu alaikum, dear family. At this time, could we please stand for prayer? In the manner in which you are most comfortable, follow along silently. Surely I am being turned to thee, O Allah, striving to be upright to he who originated the heavens and the earth. And I am not of the polytheists. Surely my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death are all for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. No associate has he in this am I commanded, and I am of those who submit. O Allah, thou art the king. There is no God but thee. Thou art my Lord, and I am thy servant, and I have been greatly unjust to myself, and I confess my faults. So grant me protection against all my faults, for none grants protection against faults but thee. And guide me into the best of morals, for none can guide into the best of morals but thee. And turn away from me the evil and the indecent morals, for none can turn away from me the evil and the indecent morals but thee. And O oh Allah, make Muhammad successful, and make the true followers of Muhammad successful. As thou didst make Abraham and the true followers of Abraham successful, for surely thou art praised and magnified. And O oh Allah, bless Muhammad, and bless the true followers of Muhammad. As thou didst bless Abraham and the true followers of Abraham, for surely thou art praised and magnified. I mean. Amen. You may be seated. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful, we give praise and thanks to Allah for his coming and appearing to us in the personage of Master W. Fard Muhammad, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. We thank him for coming to seek and save that which was and is still lost today in spite of all the wonderful work that has been done with us as a people, we're still lost. But we thank him for coming 9,000 miles and spending three and one half years with us. And in that time, at a meeting like this one, at the end of that meeting, there was something called acceptance that we still do today across our nation. We asked for acceptance to ask us to come on back if we haven't already and join back on to your own. And at the end of that meeting, a man came, and he came like you, sitting in the seat, wanting to hear the good news, wanting to hear the truth. And he heard that. And upon his coming, this man, being from the rules of the south of Georgia, his father and his grandfathers were both Baptist ministers. So he was familiar with what this man was saying. And as he, you know, listened to him, he said, I, I know those words. And then knowing those words, at the end of the meeting when acceptance was given out, he went up and when it was his turn to talk to the master teacher, he got close to him and he said to him, I know who you are. And the master says to him, yes, but who knows it but you. Pulled him close and kind of pushed him on. And a relationship developed between those two. That is the reason we are sitting here today. And the man who uttered those words, I know who you are. We say that he is Allah's wise choice. That Georgia-born black man, a giant among men. He was born Elijah Poole, but because of the wonderful work he was doing raising a dead black man and black woman, he became known as the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right. All praise is due to Allah for that wonderful human being. Yes, however, however, I personally did not meet Master Fard Muhammad, and I did not meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But the man that walks among us today that is causing me, like you, to fall deeper in love, not only with this teaching, but with myself and with my people that look like me, the fallen ones. I look in the mirror and I'm not, I'm not in disdain. I'm not in dismay because of my dark skin. No, maybe I'm not as dark as others, but I'm still among the black human family. And I love what I see when I look in that mirror, but it's because of this man that caused me to fall deeper in love with myself and my own. This man, he is the Messiah that walks among us. He's the door, he's the vine. <laughs> he is the true leader. Not the leader, but he is the leader that is for us in this dispensation of time. He's our champion and he is our illustrious leader, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And it is in those three holy and righteous names I greet you all once again. Brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace, of Assalamu alaikum. And if you don't know what that means, that simply means may peace be unto you. And as the Honorable Louis Farrakhan likes to share with us, that that's more than just a casual greeting. It's actually a prayer. 
So every time, you know, our brothers and sisters in the church will say to us sometimes, pray for me. Well, every time I give you the greetings of Isalam Alaikum, I have in that act said a prayer for you and for me. But if we're really on the same accord, when I give that wonderful greeting and that spirit, a wonderful spirit, if you return it in like manner, then the prayer is already being made up somewhere in the universe that we both will get what it is that we want to get. So you return greeting by saying, Wa alaikum salam. Yes, and that cheer, you know, you, you, you energize up, you know. Yes, sir. That's like a pep talk, but it's, it's more than that. It gets into the ear, and then it gets into the cells of the body. No matter how bad you felt, once it gets into the ear, it gets into the bloodstream. And you know the science of that if you haven't heard it. Light traveling from the sun travels at a, what, a rate of 186,000 miles per second. And then in that time, it takes 8 minutes and 20 seconds or 500 seconds for it to strike the earth at its equator and cause it to spin at the terrific speed of 1,037 and a third miles per hour. I said, well, okay, brother, what they got to do with what you're talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that blood traveling from your head to your heel and back again that process is the same as the speed of light. He said it takes 8 minutes and 20 seconds or 500 seconds for that process to complete itself. And in that time, no matter how down you may feel or I may feel, if we can inject truth into our ears, it gets into the bloodstream, and that truth travels at the speed of light, hitting every cell within our body, causing us to perk up, stand up and put us back where we're supposed to be. Isn't that a beautiful teaching? All praise is due to Allah. So dear family, that greeting is so powerful. However, I didn't know that until the Honorable Louis Farrakhan said it. I mean, all we do when we get up here, we ain't, we're not giving you anything new. We're just bearing witness to what the teacher told us. Uh, we can't say anything new. This man has spoke billions of words. I didn't say hundreds of thousands, millions of words. Like his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. People will say, will tell, will, will say in, in, in conversations with one another, say, well, yeah, I was at a meeting with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I heard him say this. Don't you know that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that man was teaching whenever he sat down and opened his mouth? At the dinner table, he was giving lectures <laughs> at the dinner table. So if you didn't make that meeting, and if you was at the dinner table, you got a feeding. You got full from what he was giving you on the truth of what Almighty God Allah in the person of Master Farad Muhammad had given him. So family, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to spend your time. We haven't had charity yet, but you've already given in charity because you've given of your time. And I thank Allah for each and every one of us who was able to wake up as I forget the comedian. I think it was, uh, what's his name, Ricky Smiley. Uh, thank God that every day that I wake up on this side of the dirt. <laughs> so we're on this side of the dirt, family. That means that we have another chance to be of some circumstance. And anything that we didn't correct yesterday, we get another chance today to do it. Right. So in that, um, let me just say this. How many were on Friday evening uh, the self-improvement study course? If you weren't, whoo, it's a jewel. You missed it. But you can always go and you know, pull it back up. But try to be there. L let's listen to the title. Self-improvement is the basis for community development. Yes. Now, we think community, usually when you first hear that word, you think, oh, my neighborhood where I live. No, 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 no. The first community that we have to organize is this. This is a community of systems, circulatory, respiratory, you know, muscle skeletal, all that. These are systems that work together. If we can arrange these properly, then it won't be difficult to help arrange the houses that are on our block, in our city, in our state, and all 196,940,000 square miles of our earthly home. So dear family, I'm, I don't want to get too deep into it because I just got the signal. All I had to do with peripheral vision was look to my right, your left. That means I got to stick a pin in it. I did have something else I wanted to say, but uh, I think that will do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it down because I know this brother, he got some stuff on there that he got to... He's, He's got this. Well, just real quick. He, he said I can say it. So let me go and say it. On Friday, we read a question. Just real quick. This will be very quick, Brother Rodney. I'm not going to belabor it, brother. We were asked a question about the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Question number four read like this. What has Minister Farrakhan demonstrated to you in this message? Who is God? Mm, a question. Homework. Homework assignment. Take that with you. 
I'm not going to go into that one. Let's jump to number five just real quick. But that one, number four, you got to weigh that. Look into it deeply. That is your homework assignment. And if you're good students, you'll go look into it. Not because Brother Joseph said it, but because the minister said it. All right? Number five, has, the minister, has Minister Farrakhan accomplished anything since delivering the message, this message, February 24, 1991? That would prove this statement on page 30. I know the power that is behind that wheel, and the power of the wheel is the power that's guiding me. Mm. Woo! So let's, let's do real quick. Let's see what he's done since 1991. Well, and after 1991, black youths, you know, we were going ape. We were losing our mind killing each other, kind of like today, right? Yes, sir. So he went on the Stop the Killing Tour. He crisscrossed this nation talking to black men only. Then, I think it was the armory in New York, some words came out of his mouth. He said, I want one million of you. And he said, I saw the words come out, but I couldn't grab them <laughs> to meet me on the mall in Washington, D.C. Well, needless to say, on October the 16th, 1995, well, on a Monday in the middle of October, almost two million black men or two million or more showed up at the mall at his call. But it lets you know that God was working through him because he said he's connected to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who is connected to Master Fard Muhammad. They are on the wheel, so he is connected to them. Yes, then immediately thereafter, five years later, we had the Million Family March. We went back to the mall. Then we had the Millions More Movement. And after that, it was justice or else. I particularly like that one because the acronyms were my name. It was J-O-E, so I, I, I kind of I fell in love with that. Justice or else, praise be to Allah. All these things are leading us to one thing, family, from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and that is self-improvement. We'll never build a nation until we can self-improve and love our brothers and sisters the way we love ourselves. So with that, I am going to stick a pin in it this time. I'm not going any further, so let's put on our thinking caps and bring to this roster our brother, our Delaware Valley student regional minister, student minister Rodney Muhammad, with a loving round of applause. As-salamu alaykum. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Uh, in the most holy name of Allah, the one, the all-wise, the true, and the living God, we Thank Allah who reveals all truth and creates all things with truth so that when that thing is revealed, the truth that he created it with is revealed. Yes, sir. He's the sender of all prophets that we have made no distinction between because then we would cut up his truth. Yes, sir. To make a distinction between them makes a distinction with his truth. We choose what truth we want to believe and the truth we don't want to believe we discard it. That would damage us greatly. Yes, so we can't afford to deny a prophet or messenger simply because he didn't come from the hood. We would not be justified in our demand to the world to accept the messenger that has come from the hood. So we thank Allah for those messengers and those prophets. We thank Allah for Moses and the Torah. We thank Allah for Jesus and the gospel. And we thank Allah for Muhammad and the revelation of the Holy Quran. Well, you all accept all of that? Because the man in the Holy Quran was given the Torah. Wouldn't that mean it had to already be in existence? You can't give him something that ain't in existence. Then the Quran says, and we gave him the gospel. It would have to have already been in existence, right? Yes. Then we gave him Kitab or the book, Quran. And then after we gave him the Torah, which had wisdom, 
the gospel which had wisdom, and we gave him the book, the Quran, which had wisdom. On top of the wisdom out of each one of those books, we gave him wisdom. Could that be the supreme wisdom? And what does the supreme wisdom have to do with the Torah and its wisdom? The gospel and its wisdom and the Quran and its wisdom, could it not open up the books to help us to see each book in its proper light? So we thank Allah for all of that, but we're students of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's unequaled light and great search light of truth that searches for the truth in every truth that has come and any truth that's coming. We thank Allah for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad letting us know that God has come in the person of Master Fahd Muhammad. It ain't like they didn't tell us he was coming. And I got a feeling had it been one of theirs, they'd be demanding that we listen to him. And that the opposition to him is that he's not one of them. And so they can't control the divine narrative anymore. We thank Allah for Master Farad Muhammad's coming He's not even here. And they have not clearly been able to disprove what he brought when he was here. Just, just think about that for a minute. Then they have um, a thing when it comes to police investigation called cold case and missing persons report, and they put their expert people on it That's right. to follow the person that was here so they can find his dead body or bones to say this was the man that was in Detroit. He's dead, and uh, the claim of the Nation of Islam that he would live at least 400 years can't be true because we found his dead body. They ain't found a body yet. At all. They have not found him yet. And if he's alive and in hiding, they obviously have not found a hiding place. God, right. man. That's something to really think about. Because the enemy that cannot afford the wisdom that came from him got to be asking the police, well, y'all had arrested him. You had him in custody. Why did not you hold him and let him die in jail? Then we could prove. Wow. Dr. Wesley, our noted scholar, found out that Patty Hirsch's father, who ran the newspaper out west and said Wallace Dodd Ford was that man. So the FBI and others had arrested the man. And then they said, OK, we're going to pull up his police record. When they pull up the police record, the numbers are filed. And when we trace the numbers that were filed, they don't really match the numbers in Detroit. So what Dr. Wesley proved, they went and took the numbers from Detroit, superimposed it on a document to try to show this was the same man that was in Detroit. What Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the man we follow, he spoke 16 languages. How many languages does this man speak? And surely you would be able to show us and trace everything about this man, you can find nothing in this man's profile that's a match for the man that taught the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in Detroit. They're having a real problem. And um, 
the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his number one student, the authorities said, well, let's arrest him. He'll probably plead the fifth because he's guilty of the crimes we want to charge him with. Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't plead the fifth, and he answered all their questions. And they questioned him through the night. What a perfect story for them to take what he said in questioning and put it out in articles and books to show that he obviously was out of his mind. Questioning the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and not being prepared for the answers that came out of him showed that they were out of their mind to have God's messenger in their midst and not get him to appeal on their behalf for God's mercy in such an hour. That's insanity. You want to find a way to destroy him. So the FBI agent said to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, um, had this been 20 years earlier, we would have killed you outright. Well, what happened 20 years later that made such a, you had a gun 20 years later, you could have killed him outright 20 years later. This was the time. And it was not their season to kill him. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad answered some questions in 1933. We got him. I brought him with me. And by him being able to answer these questions, he's, you're no longer a minister. You're my messenger now. Think this over. Look at what they said. They talk about the making of devil and they talk about taking Jerusalem from the devil and but then they use some math in there. Said we predicted him in the year one of a of a different calendar. Right? The year one was a different calendar. Everything that was gonna happen within a twenty five thousand year period was predicted in the year one. So at the time of the making of devil, it says this was 15,000 19 years ago. Where did 19 come from? See, if you subtract 1933 from 1914, when his world ended, according to the lessons, you get 19 years. So rather than just say it was 15,000 years ago, according to this calendar, no, it was 15,019 years ago. Oh, man. The enemies of God are in trouble. So the most honorable Elijah Muhammad became a 100% convert. And what black folks got to realize is at the root of all our suffering, the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us is spiritual. So if it's spiritual, you can't get an answer from Joe Biden, huh? Tom Wolf, or Mayor Jim Kenney. And if we're suffering in our community because we murdering each other, like on South Street, right? The answer to that can't be the political world. It has to come from a spiritual world and content. The nation of Islam's teaching is really a spiritual message. How to eat to live is not a Jenny Craig project. Right, it's not a, right? It's, it's not a doctor, what was the other doctor's name who was teaching them what to eat and different things? I mean, Dr. Atkins. It's not a Dr. Atkins program. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, how to eat to live is a spiritual law. 
that governs our physical reality. Because spiritually, we are scheduled to live a very long time. And as Dr. Lean, when he was minister of Moss Number no. 4, you know, used to always warn us, yes, you can live a long time, but if you don't preserve your body, you won't be able to stay here a long time. Right. So the spiritual law that comes from Master Fahd Muhammad shows you how to preserve your body so you can stick around. Um, so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he not only was at the temple, and you have to keep in mind, he didn't set this up. God set this up. Right. From what I've read, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad went to a temple meeting. He went to a check procedure. From what I've read, uh, after the message was given, whoever wanted to accept came down the aisle. He came down the aisle. He didn't make up the aisle. It was already made up. He came down and accepted like we accepted. Huh? The difference between our acceptance and his acceptance is that he recognized the man that he was taking acceptance from, who was represented to him as Prophet Farad and Professor Ford. Right? But he said, neither is he a prophet or a professor. You're the man that the scriptures predicted would come. That my father used to preach about in the Baptist church, but he didn't know him. But I'm born to recognize him. So the man pulls Elijah closer to him and whispers in his ear, yeah, but who else knows it? So the process began. And so he takes a servant that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said these words that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a moving reality. He said, and the best thing I ever could have done was recognize him. A moving reality is you say, uh-oh, he's an FOI. Uh-oh, he's in the ministry. Uh-oh, now he's a messenger. Uh-oh, the exalted Christ, Mahdi, a moving reality. And by me recognizing him, I could accept him at every station. And um, it's amazing because we live in a world where the scientist knows a hell of a lot. But the scientist's mindset is, even though I know a lot, there's much more that I don't know. So I keep studying discovering, examining, analyzing things so I can what? Learn more. But the world we live in, the theologian who has read very little think he know everything. And the people who are taught by theologians who ain't even read their Bible. Soon as you join up with Farrakhan, they ready to tell you why you're going in the wrong direction. And they can't even prove they in the right one from the book they have. We're not trying to put nobody down, but we're saying this is a time for learning. And I brought out the supreme wisdom because the nation of Islam is a classroom for higher learning. Higher learning will produce greater cultivation of us so that we can do some things about what happened on South Street because South Street just manifests like in all other cities where we dwell. Come on, come on. We are nowhere near being a master of our own circumstances. The self-improvement course that Brother Joseph is talking about, it, it's to put you on the road to mastering your own circumstance. You have a man in front of you who is a supreme, by Allah's permission, a supreme educator who not only teaches you but then provides you with his own life 
an example. Because 90% of the students' learning comes from what they see and not what they hear, right? So the man teaches you then lives in front of you as an example of what he's teaching and what it can produce. He has already done it. What we can't do is what they have done to us in this world is to make us put a Jesus so far out there we can't get to him. We got a fire kind right here with us and we're about to in a spooky way put him so far out there we'll never get to him. When the example is so that the student knows that what he sees the teacher doing, he can achieve that same thing, she can achieve that same thing if they're willing to go through what the student went through to become a master. So I'm thankful that a master taught my teacher. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan taught directly from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And then after being taught, put through a series of phases and courses. Today's message is the same. Somebody's trying to kill you. I know it looks like we're killing each other. And when you go through the actions, it is a black hand pulling the trigger. And the victim on the other side of the barrel of that gun is another black person. So you could say, factually, that we're killing one another. But at the root of it, there's a fingerprint that further investigation would reveal. That's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad answered the question about the colored man, skunk of the planet Earth, because not to put somebody down and be derogatory, but the skunk is the only creature. Listen to me. The skunk is the only creature whose presence is not necessary for you to know that he's been there and done his work. So I greet you with the greeting words of peace. I salam alaikum. Um, somebody's trying to kill us. You fix your oatmeal in the morning, fights cholesterol. You put cinnamon on your oatmeal, it brings your blood pressure down along with exercise and don't be eating a lot of crazy stuff, right? You come off blood pressure medication if you follow that regimen. But something else is in the oatmeal. Arsenic. Now you say, I know I didn't put it in there. Something's dangerous. And you know, I jumped out of bed, a rattlesnake was put under the cover. Damn. Acid was put in the mouthwash, so when I brush my teeth and try to wash my mouth out, if I take the mouthwash in and the acid, it'll burn my tongue right out of my mouth. Let me hurry up and get out of here and go to work, but a bomb is placed under my car. Now, how long would it take for you to realize somebody's trying to kill you? Yet, a careful examination of our community is one big 21st century booby trap. Somebody's trying to kill us. And in so many ways, um, we talked about the earth being the Lord's, as the Bible says. The earth is, in its total square mileage area, what, 196,940,000 square miles. Not one acre did God's enemy create. That's why we're given that territory. He's, he's on it, but he didn't create it. And if the earth is the Lord's, then the earth is following a law that's not being dictated by the people that's ruling people on the earth. And the people 
that's ruling people on the earth, they're in violation of the earth and the Lord that owns the earth. However, Paul doesn't say God is the God of this world. Paul says Satan is the God of this world. Right. Right. Well, wait, I thought God, this was God. The earth and the world are not the same thing. See, the world represents a sphere of mental actions that govern the people that live on this world or this earth. And the will, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that everything in the universe that's alive, it's a manifestation of God's will. I have had a globe once in school, and I set the globe on the desk, and the globe came with a mantle that it sits on so I could spin it and get to any part on the earth that I wanted to look at. You ever have a globe like that? Now, if I had just set it down there, it would have rolled right off the desk. So it needed something to hold it in place so that I could turn it. And while it's turning, in its rotation, it could maintain its place. However, when you fly outside of Earth's atmosphere, and look back at the earth, there's no mantle built there. There's nothing built there that earth is sitting on so that it can turn at 1,037 and one-third miles per hour. So if it's nothing there, what's holding it? Come on, somebody. See, it's the will of God that's holding it and the other planets and the worlds that are turning in this universe. What is the will? According to the study guides, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that the will is the faculty of conscious, not unconscious, conscious and or deliberate action. So when the human being wills something, it says that their faculties are working. When you will something, it says now that you're using the power of your own being, which is your mind. Because he teaches us that the will is the mind's control over its own actions. There are ways that I think that are destructive for me, but if I got control over the actions of my mind, I can come out of that way of thinking. And I can change my behavior. Are you listening to me? Everybody wants more money to stop the killing. More money will buy more guns. I think we mean well, but you've never been able to get a million black men, two million black men to pay their own way to Washington to hear what you have to say. But you want them to listen to you, but you don't want to listen to the man that was able to call two million. Look like you need control. Yes, sir. First, over your own thinking. Before you can go on the streets of Philadelphia and get control of some other folks. Go ahead. Go ahead. So council people called me this week and they said, well, they want you to engage with them, Brother Muhammad. I said, uh, we can engage with them. But none of the young people that have shot people and none of the young people that have died had their own house or apartment. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody else made sure they had a place to sleep. Come on, come on. Somebody else made sure they had food in their stomach. Look like they just as sick as the people that are out there doing this insanity. I don't want to talk to the young guys on the street. I want to talk to them and their parents. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's talk to the whole team. 
The young people not in trouble. Hell, we're in trouble. The whole community is in trouble. The young people that are killing and dying can't even pay for their own funeral. So if we're paying for it, show me one of them that's got a life insurance policy that they're paying for every month. No, we're paying for it, letting them live any kind of way they want to live, the hell with whether they are menace to your neighbor or not. See, they can do that to your neighbor because you don't give a damn about your neighbor. Right, 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 right. Because if you did, then you would rein them in. Look, I know you out there involved in something. I don't know what it is, but you you involved in something. You're hanging around with this, that, and the other. And stop talking about somebody else is a bad influence over my ch Your child might be the bad influence. And it ain't just young people that's killing. See, we got to go deeper. We got to have a real conversation in the black community. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan talks about murder after reckless sex. Because the enemy has taken a six inch metaphorical needle, shoved it in our brain, and he's killed the vision of the black man. When your vision is killed and you got all this energy, but you don't know, you, first of all, you ain't even got a desire to build your own world. Because your enemy has convinced you with that needle shoved in your brain, you can't build your own world. So we see each other. What's up, man? No, it's your world. I'm just living in it. So when you can't envision, there's no hope for you. And the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that hopelessness is at the root of our murdering each other. We can't even hope for nothing better. Well, Governor Wolf need to do something. Jim Kenney need to do something. Joe Biden need to do something. Just listen to us. What other community? Irish, Italian, Jews, Asians is running to somebody else to do for them. The most they're calling on Biden, Wolf, and Jim Kenney to do, give us some money, we'll work our own plan. You driving down the street and you cross Shelton him and somebody ran right into your car and totaled it, you don't expect the person that ran into your car to fix it. You getting their information, insurance, so they can pay for it. But you're taking it to the people that know something about cars to bring that car and restore it. A man wrecked our life on an intersection in life, and you're going to go back to the man that wrecked you, asking him to do the damn repairs? That shows a level of insanity right there. No wonder our children. care so little about life because we've been careless with ours. We're not bad people. Our will is broken. The faculty of conscience. See, black is not just color. Black lives matter. It ain't about the color black. Black was here before God. He created himself out of black. He challenged darkness and won. Black is the championship belt of God. Let me put on black so you can understand that when I went up against black, I conquered it. I'm not original. Because I'm black, I'm black because I'm original. So don't ask who is the black man, ask who is the original man. Right, right, right. Then they'll tell me he's the Asiatic black man. 
that right? Black is not just color, black is consciousness. To be black is to be conscious, to be aware of the giant scheme of what you're living in. So it, it's consciousness and it's culture. The way he lives support the nature that he created himself in. He always thinks, because he's conscious, in a way that serves his best interest. The Negro thinks in a way that's destructive for him. <sighs> Black is a connection. It's a cosmic connection with the origin of the universe. There was no universe till God created it. Why? Because you can't have a universe without mind going into it to shape things. Thoughts shape things. They don't just shape on their own. So, the original mind, the Quran says, that Allah created the creation with truth. Well, was your mind created? Yes, yours and mine was created. So if he created everything with truth, then he created our mind with truth. Well, I need a house for the mind to rest in. So he sets up a thing called the brain. Well, I can't have the mind right and the brain wrong, so he made the cells of the brain to think right. God. This is a God that was guaranteeing your success and my success. And the minister said, we go against the beauty of the brain when we think wrong. So stress and distress sets up in the brain because you're thinking wrong. You ain't even thinking right. You can't think in a way that serves your best interest. That brings stress. And because matter, which is either a solid, a liquid, or a gas, and energy, like matter, can't be created, nor can it be destroyed. Only transferred. So we go into funerals. Matter, solid, the liquid that was in the body has been drained out of the body, right? And the gas that would come from breathing in oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide, that gas is gone because the acts of breathing is no longer taking place, right? So we say at the funeral, here lie the remains of so-and-so. Where's the energy? that was in the body, can't be destroyed, transferred. Mm. So what does the enemy do? We got to get him to depart from the truth. So Mr. Muhammad shows us a traitor came with an interpretation, right? A promise. That's what we've been getting since we've been here. Promises. I heard Brother Joseph mentioning when we got to the Millions More movement, the, the minister said, we've been marched into ovens. And he said, you know, our homes are broken, our neighborhoods are broken, right? Our lives are broken, our minds are broken. And all of our brokenness leads to a stream of broken what? Promises. So the trader promised us, man, I can get you more gold in another land. You can get more for less. That's how we get swindled every year. It's against the principle of Islam to think of doing less. And out of doing less, you're going to get more. That's why the honorable Elijah Muhammad he, he, he warned the Muslims that were with him. If you're still working a job for the white man, give the white man his eight hours. Don't cheat him. 
Because once you learn how to cheat him, guess what? You bring the practice of cheating to yourself. You sign a contract. You fill out the application and sign your name to it that if he hires you, you're going to work. Then do the work that you applied for and agreed to, right? And when you learn to practice that, when, it, when you start laboring to build your own world, you're using the same practice. But if you spend eight hours a day, 40 hours a week ducking work, when you join up with the Honorable Louis Farrakhan to build, and it will take labor, you'll still be what? Ducking work. Folk will text you, can't get a text back. Call you, can't reach you. So if truth is what the original is built up in, then we got to get him to depart from the truth. Why? Because we can't destroy the truth. If we could destroy it, we would just destroy it, and then he wouldn't have nothing to work with. But the truth is too great for us. In fact, we're afraid of the truth because the truth is a light, and it will expose us. So what we got to do, we got to get him to depart from the truth. And efforts to get us to depart from the truth kept failing. The history of us here shows that there were many slave uprisings. And the early stages, Du Bois writes in The Souls of Black Folks and other writings, that the early stages of getting us to depart from what was in our best interest, we set up church under a tree. But the overseer was right there with a whip and a shotgun. Right. That if the preacher dared say anything that defied the, the order set up on the plantation, they would kill him or at least beat him within an inch of his life. You following me? So we had to speak in code. One of the, one of the famous codes was the old gospel, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. See, you seen that now, and, and, and people are getting lulled to sleep in the church, but that was coded language. We breaking out tonight, and we meeting down by the riverside. That old cracker, he don't know what we really saying. Come on, Sister Sarah, sing the song. See, the early gospels had messages in them. So the codes would give us, see, we, done, we still got the gospel, but we done lost the code. Come on, man. Uh, come on. And why have we lost the code? Because we done lost the will to break free. Right. Hell, I sat in a meeting with the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He told me the hereafter ain't no longer the goal of the believer. I said, damn, if the hereafter ain't the goal, that means we, we dress up, but really we're just trying to find the best place in this world we could settle. We done lost the energy and the will to build a new world. That's disastrous because then that would mean God got to trade us and get a team that's willing to build something new. He didn't come for us to find the best place we can here. Money, good homes, and friendships in all walks of life wasn't designed for us to find our friends in this world. He'll give you a friend in this world. He'll make your enemy do something for you. He did it for the children of Israel. They didn't think they had no money coming. So they were just packing up with their goats and sheep and stuff, as you see in the Ten Commandments, and say, it's time for us to go. I said, well, you're going to need some money where you're going. So in the 11th chapter of Exodus, God tells Moses, go and tell the children of Israel to require of the Egyptians their gold and silver. Sound like reparations to me. 
we, we get ready to work with Encobra to, to, I was meeting with them this week right here. They came in, we, we're talking about a commission now. And these young people coming up, they're not playing no game. They don't want no, you know, Sheila Jackson Lee and, and, and Kanye, Congressman Conyers, they were talking about a commission to study reparations. They said, we don't need to study it. We know we've been robbed. We know who the thief is. We know what he took. We need some of it back to restore our community. We just need a commission to talk about what steps we need to take. Who needs to do what? I, I said the only thing I corrected him on was so that you understand the Nation of Islam's position on reparation. We don't want reparation just from the white man of America. The European was involved. We want reparations from Europe. Come on, somebody. We want reparations from the white Arabs who use Islam as a cover to enslave our people. As the ministers say, the white Arabs, they got an answer for what they did. Don't be talking about we all Muslim. And any African chiefs that worked in collusion who were ignorant of what the final impact would be, because you know they didn't let them in on all of it. Hell, they got to drop down. That's why after the Million Man March, the minister was requiring of them, we want some large land in Africa, right? So that we can take people who are incarcerated. Let us into the jails for 24 months to teach the incarcerated. And then after that, those that are willing to go, we take them because the rest of their life going to be spent in a tiny jail cell and a prison yard, right? Getting institutionalized. Then we take you to that separate land, not to live among Africans in their civilization, but to make our own nation out of that. That's the Honorable Louis Farrakhan's plan. Read Torchlight for America. Huh? That's all I talk about when I go into prisons. Why well, talk about something else? And I said, don't think you're going to be slick. Ain't no parole system. No, no, no. I'm serious. Where we're going, there's no parole system. If you go through the 24, that's what the 24 months of, of teaching and training is about. Because you got to be trained out of the way the cracker has taught you. There's no plea deals. So when you go there and steal, you don't go on probation. We bring you out. Whatever hand you stole with first is chopped off. We bandage you up. You can go on about your business. You don't have to, you don't have to suffer another day in jail, not another hour. You rape, kill. You don't have six months to eight years before some kind of execution takes place by Friday. Right after Salat al Juma, you're brought up and your head is taken off your body. So it'd be another whole set of laws. So you've got to be taught. Because we know what has happened to us here. Yeah, so, I mean... We understand what we in, and we understand our condition because a great light has come to us, okay? The devil saw too many uprisings, you know? And one uprising, I think it was the Fulani tribe, they just said, we won't give him the privilege of using us. Because as we said last week, Goodell's slave code showed that we were needed for three things. Our bodies were needed for hard labor, right? Our bodies were needed for breeding, and our bodies were needed for scientific use, experimentations to further medical science, right? So that he would not have the use of our body after the destruction of our souls. They, their uprising was they took themselves and they held hands and they went and drowned themselves so the white man wouldn't have the privilege of the use of their bodies over the years. Extreme, yes, but to be a slave is extreme. 
So, so when they saw these kind of uprisings, there was only one way to make a perfect slave. And if you read English uh, lesson number C1, you'll see that the way they used was, we can't deal with the adults and, and, and a socialization process, we gotta take the babies. We can't get them to depart from the truth. It's always one. Somebody says something. So rather than trying to get them to depart from the truth, let's just make sure they never see the truth at all. Take the babies and nurse them and raise them on a study diet of ignorance and fear. And they'll never know the difference. And that caused us to lose our original mind. Once the original mind is lost, we don't even have a mind that will help us to serve our best interest. Right now, anyone who's fired up, because it don't stop the fire of God, anyone that's fired up that wants to lead us, they have to be willing to suffer what we put on them because of the way we were made. The other thing that happens to the mind when you're no longer in the truth, like a wound that can't hold life, there's always a miscarriage. That's, that's what the womb of the black world is like. When the germ comes in, that new life could begin. We can't hold on to the truth long enough. Because we're in a world where we're constantly fed falsehoods. And we've grown so comfortable in the falsehoods, we say, why shouldn't we believe if I'm doing that which I found our father's doing, was God gonna charge me with that? Shoot, I was young. I came up, our fathers were doing this, so we're doing, and they say, even though your fathers were wrong, that's what makes revelation challenging. Because we've come up generations doing the same thing, and sometimes when you do the same thing so long, it makes it seem right to you. And any call for change looks like a conspiracy. But you're really living under the conspiracy. Oh, man. The last thing that happens when they corrupt the mind like that is, see, white supremacy means and only means, uh, and the only means by which you could make white supreme is black pathology. Black people have to be made spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and politically, commercially, everything, we have to be made sick. Even to the point of death. When you do a pathology report, that's an autopsy. They found that you can take a dead body and the dead body will still talk to you. You say, they dead. What happened? Let's do an autopsy. And when they come back with the autopsy, they can tell you even if the person died under stress, if they were attacked, whether they were bludgeoned to death or that, sometimes you think this killed them and the autopsy shows something else killed them. They think somebody, well, we found them in the water, they must have drowned. We, the autopsy will show they were killed before they were put in the water. See, to throw you off. So um, when you do a pathology report on black people, that's to go back to look at how we were destroyed. We keep thinking we can be put back together by putting on a few dashikis and giving some kind of event, man. The ministers say we're losing our mind if we think a three-day conference will empower you over a man who has successfully ruled over you for 400 years. You got to think. A conference is a good start, but it won't do everything. One of the things that white supremacy shows is that it needs black pathology in order to live. Can't nobody be supreme over you unless you done lost control of yourself. 
When somebody can control you, as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is teaching us now, we're colonized, you have to have a colonizer. And he's able to set the rules and everything. And just as it's pathological for another man to need to rule over another man like that, it's just as pathological to adjust to our oppression. Just make an adjustment to it is, is just as lethal and dangerous as it is for somebody to be over you that'll kill you when you don't act right. The other thing that we don't see, we think, well, if I just get my baby through this Ivy League school. See, that's part of adjusting. Once they go here, everything's going to be all right. We're not against education. In fact, we encourage education. The Honorable Boy Elijah Muhammad, when he first received this revelation from what we're told by the minister, the first black folks he went to were the educated class. And he found out that even though they were academically advanced and they had skill sets that could set us up almost overnight, they have been killed mentally in thinking that the education that they had received or the schooling that they had received somehow made them immune to what was happening to their people. So he ended up having to turn around and come back to those who were living in the dreads of society called the mud of civilization, an uncivilized group, and began preaching to us and they criticize him for having uh, ex-convicts. They criticize him for taking people who lived in houses of ill repute. They criticize him for taking those of us that were delinquent and living on the streets. He said, but all the more credit to me as their messenger and the God that we worship, that he could take those of us who were in the worst condition and be able to do more with us than all the educated class of Negroes that the white man had. Our morals have to be elevated, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said. Let me just show something here of what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad showed us. Number one, we're not Negroes. We got to get rid of that. And the teaching that he brought, it took us back. We're not being taught things that ain't already out here. This is, a, this is about a hidden knowledge and a hidden wisdom. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't teach anything that just came up. It's always been here. But not only did we not know it, our enemies did not know it to teach us. And part of that teaching was to end up calling us Negroes, which came from what? Necro? The Greek word for death. Because when the Greeks came amongst the learned of us, and they saw us building tombs and that for the royal families so that their lives would go on, we put fruit and other foods in there when we buried them in those tombs. They said we were preoccupied with death. And because we were preoccupied with death, spending our life building great tombs, obviously we call them necro. The C consonant interchangeable with G, so they called us negro. We weren't called negro because the color of our skin was black. We were called negro because the state of our mind was dead. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wanted to get rid of that term. Now you have to remember that Negro was acceptable to us because the term that was totally unacceptable to us was black. Right, 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 right. Thank you. Come on. I don't know what they were fighting about on South Street that made those guys shoot at each other and fight each other like that. But back in the 30s, one of the things that would make you fight like that is somebody calling you black. Right. Come on. We were so dead against black. The only one teaching that we were the Asiatic black man was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was at the core of it. 
and all over the country, Master Fab Muhammad told him, make ministers and send them into all the cities. They taught what he taught. Soon the term became less detrimental to our ear and became more beneficial. By the 60s, this is when white supremacy really got in trouble. The term came up, black power. See, Dr. King was out front, but he was using the term Negro, but Stokey Carmichael and them came up with black power. And it caught on and resonated like Black Lives Matter today. See? Next thing you know, we said, hell, black is beautiful. So we didn't try to press our hair all the time. Sisters grew naturals. Brothers grew the natural look. We, we were defying everything that white America did. He tried to get ahead of it. He was making kentacloths and different things to try to profit in everything. But we wanted to identify with Africa and get connected. He had to work overtime flooding the community with heroin. We done live past the heroin, so now he's flooding it with guns. When we had all the heroin out there, we couldn't hardly find a gun. There were more fist fights in the black community. Notwithstanding, the gangs were better organized. Chicago was the number one gang city of America. The West Side alone had Bobby Gore and Callaway. They ran a gang called the Vice Lords. The Vice Lords, at the time I was growing up, I wasn't even 16. They were at 12,000. That ain't a gang. That's a nation. That's just on the West Side of Chicago. I was beaten up by Jeff Ford when he was coming up. They caught me on 63rd Street, but the Blackstone Rangers had 12,000 then, they got up to almost 25,000. The disciples were at nine to 10,000 just on the east side. That wasn't even what David Boxdale had on the west side. But with all those gangs, you don't have the level of homicides that you have right now in Chicago. And you had gang leaders that if David Boxdale said, I don't want to hear a firecracker, nobody shot a gun. I don't give a damn how mad you got. And when Jeff Ford would put the word out, we, we, we agreed with the police, ain't going to be no shootings. Believe me, they had their own police force. Chicago police never got to anybody that violated Jeff Ford's instructions. That's why you hear the minister mentioning them. And then by the time Larry Hoover and them come along with the gangster disciples, this was a large group, 30-something thousand. So it was the gang city. They said, the US News World Report said the gangs were so big, but not just big, they were organized. That they said the Jamaican posse and the uh, Colombian drug lords never could get a foothold into Chicago, Illinois. And the way the projects were set up with one mile of projects uh, going a mile long. Can you imagine driving a mile and there's nothing but project buildings like you got Richard Allen and yeah, right. Raymond Rosen and the other ones that were here? Well, for one whole mile called Stateway Gardens. Buildings that were designed one way in, no other way out. You got to come back out. Cabrini Green got so bad, that's what they made good times off of. Mm. Yeah, but, you know, my thing was, they was more organized. See, there's no organization today of people that you could sit down who could put the word on the street and stop a lot of the madness. Our morals, because vision is gone from the black man. Our morals because purpose is gone from the black man. Because his will is broken. So the faculty of conscious and deliberate actions, he don't even think on that. 
He's looking at the next woman to lay down with. But his mind can't even come up with a plan that could build a new world for her and the life that may come from their union. So our energy has gone into sex and the black woman, she's given up on looking for anything meaningful coming from the black man. So when you look at her run down his credentials, it's what kind of money he got, what kind of, does he have mad money? You know, is he driving a nice car? Are they rolling with, can I have a good time with him? Is he a good lover or a sex person in that? You don't hear nothing in there about, can, is he capable of building another world? She know it don't even occur to him. So she don't even say to him, why don't you and your homies, you know, get together and talk about starting a bank or something. She know he don't think that big. So she don't even bring it up. So the most she's hoping for is you get a job and keep one if she got to rely on anything. Huh? Am I telling the truth? Amen, I mean, this is our story. You and Muhammad's mosque, we got to tell the truth here. With our morals so low and our identity really stolen, you talk about identity theft, this is real identity theft. Huh? That's right. Self hatred sets in because of the ignorant state of the mind. Someone asked the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan one, how are we going to ever get rid of self hatred? He said, when ignorance is destroyed, self-hatred will go with it. Isn't that beautiful? I don't have to sit up and try to cultivate a, a destruction of my hatred for you and cultivate a new love for you. Just get rid of my ignorance state. The more I learn about myself. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, uh, we're not Negroes. Look at this. He's, he's bringing the identity up now because God, whose proper name is Allah, has taught me who we are. That's right. That's right. We are not colored people because God has taught me who the colored people are. He didn't say there weren't any colored people. He just said, we're not the colored people. The colored people are the ones that you are under because they color everything with their own narrative. The American Negro, and this is the place where Negro was created, the American Negro is without a knowledge of self. What, so when you, when you and I don't have a knowledge of ourself and, and our mind has been killed, they took us from a baby so we don't know the difference. It's not that we're looking for who we really are. It never occurred to us to look for that. We thought Negro was who we really were. Whatever they said we were, that's what we thought we were. Look at, and you know, at the, at the, it, when you talk in ancient terms, you know, they look at the Greeks as being our primary educators. But the truth is, the Greeks sat at the foot of our fathers and learned greatly as Aristotle uh, once reported. But look at this. This is Aristotle here, a quote from him, tolerance and apathy are the last virtues of a dying society. Now apathy, see when you tolerate something, you just go along with it, but you know it ain't right. That's about where most American citizens are right now. They know certain things aren't right, but they basically just tolerating it. It's not right that they have gone up say on the gas prices the way that they have but you know what we're going to tolerate it because we're going to convince ourselves I got to keep trying to go wherever it is I'm trying to go so I got to keep paying the high price for the gas do you know if we sat away from them gas stations for two or three days and didn't go in them they would, they would sit down and come up with something but we, we don't have sense enough to stick together like that so that's tolerant but apathy when you looked at the, at, the, at the tone scale, when we were learning Dianetics, you ain't even angry no more. 
If somebody talks to you, you're not even depressed about it. Apathy means you just become so indifferent. You're free from depression. You're free from anger. You don't even care about it no more. It is what it is. Huh? And you're through trying to give any energy, mental or physical, to make any kind of change. Now look at Aristotle, he is the father of what's called formal logic. Formal logic means you have a major premise, you set up what's called a minor premise, and that gives you a conclusion. The major premise, all men are made in the image of God. This, was their, this is their thinking. The minor premise is God, as everybody knows, is not a Negro. Conclusion, therefore, the Negro is not a man. Oh, don't nobody think like that. You three-fifths of a person in the Articles of the Constitution. Where they come up with that? See, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan teaches us they start with an attitude, set up a belief system, then they codify it in the law. And when they codified laws here to set up the Constitution of the United States of America, you and I in there as three-fifths of a man. Where'd that come from? It came from a prevailing attitude. Yep, so, so you know, we're, 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 we're put in like that. So um, once we get rid of ignorance, Self-hatred will go. You can't get rid of ignorance without reading. You can't get rid of ignorance without staying plugged into the thing that takes you out of your ignorant state. You can't get rid of that. But the more you keep flying away from it, departing from it, you're cutting yourself off from what's giving you life. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said the original Man, in his original state, had checkmate power. So when a new people came among the original people and began spreading lies, causing the original people to fight and kill one another, an investigation took place. And they said, you know what? We didn't have this problem until these newcomers came amongst us. According to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So we rounded up all that we could find. And we ran them from amongst us. We didn't find all of them. But the ones that we didn't find, they didn't carry on no devilishment. Why? Because our environment was set up with checkmate power. But in America... We don't have the checkmate power that we had then. We don't round up troublemakers and run them out of the best part that we made and preserved for ourselves. Put them out in the worst part since they want to make the worst kind of trouble for the people who found the best part. We keep the troublemakers with us and then let them bite on. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, uh, when he dealt with the levels of strength of his enemies, he's got Mecca, he's got Rome, he's got the United States government, he's got the police, he's got all these people against him. But he said, the most troublesome source for him was the weak-minded Muslim who would listen to them, the troublemakers, and let the troublemakers bring them into this is why you, the study guides are so important that he's talking about. Study guide 17 talks yes, about that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Taking weak-minded people, because when Satan's outside of God's house, you know, his, his language is always opposition to the man of God, opposition to his community. Look at the Quran. It has a section that deals with the devil's opposition to man. You can't be opposed to man without being opposed to the thing that's making him a man. So you've got to be able to destroy that process. You follow what I'm saying? 
when you get to the 15th surah, it says the devil's opposition against what? The righteous. Right. That means the man that they opposed, they couldn't stop him. Now he's built a community of righteous people. But the conversation that the devil's having with God is that when he couldn't stop the man, he's going to stop the community. He said, then, you know, the man, he couldn't stop him. So he said, now, when it comes to the community, you're going to find most of them ungrateful, God. So God says, then I'll just fill hell up with all of you. But it tells you, he's not going to lead the righteous alone. He's looking for the weak one. Because that's what predators do. Predators don't look for the strongest one in the herd. Predators look for the weakest one in the herd. And then they prey on the weak one. To help bring about their ends. In study guide 17, they call the facilitator. The weak one is not consciously thinking evil. But because Satan changes his language when he comes inside of God's house, his language inside of God's house is self-righteousness. But if you look at the devil who insists on being the ruler of society because the color of his skin is white, rule with white supremacy, then you see someone who thinks they're better. But once he comes in God's house and talks self-righteousness, if you look at the root of self-righteousness, it's because that person thinks they're better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They'll criticize another believer. Y'all better listen to me. Because only your righteousness is going to sustain you. Only my righteousness is going to sustain me in a time like we're coming in. So the way to get us inside the house, somebody got to make you think they're so righteous that somehow God has put them in a position. To judge another one of God's righteous and come up with a sentence for them. That ain't God working, that's Satan. Yeah. Um. We have to master our own circumstances. Why? The model that we live under, we've been stripped of our history, right? right, right. Look at what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. This is the Christ. Now, one of the attributes of Allah, the all-wise God, is knowledge. You can't be like Allah and you are unknowledgeable. God is not ignorant. The more you want to become like him, the more knowledgeable you have to become. Yes, Knowledge builds us up, right? He's all wise and that, I mean, the Bible says, in all thy getting, get understanding. Yes, and we've been told repeatedly by the minister, it took the Honorable Elijah Muhammad 40 years to understand his mission. We act like he fully understood it on day one. He was still learning. Up to the time of the departure, he, had, he was learning more and more about his mission. The all-wise God, he has not. Knowledge is the result of learning and is a force or energy. Listen to this. That makes the bearer of knowledge accomplish. You can't be a non-accomplishing person talking about you with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That man stood up in front of the minister in St. Louis trying to front the minister off. I've been with the messenger for 40 years. He ain't got nothing but a suit and a bow tie. And the minister told him, brother, I wouldn't tell nobody that. I wouldn't tell the world I've been under this unequal light for 40 years and this is all I got to show for it. Be careful trying to be self-righteous. That's the language of Satan inside Muhammad's mosque. Come on now. Knowledge is the result of learning. It's a force of energy. It makes you accomplish 
and or overcome obstacles. So when I'm reading the credo, when I came in 40 years ago, it said, meet and overcome all obstacles in my path. It didn't tell me run from it, stumble over it, trip over it, let it run over me. If it's an obstacle, meet it, and you can overcome it. I can overcome barriers. I can overcome resistance. In fact, God means possessor of power and force. Is us killing each other in our community an obstacle? Huh? Is it a barrier? Is it keeping us from doing well, Who's going to set up a business? Oh, I'm going to set up a business and really serve my people and risk getting killed? Sound like a barrier to me. Somehow you think because you set up, they're going to overlook you and kill everybody else? You on the list too. Uh. So, you know, when we, when we don't have the right model, and the true model for us to live under, it's been hidden from us. When they stripped us of our history, they stripped us of the true model for us to live under. We think just being nice and keep your lawn cut. And, uh, you know, I understand how you can think that because you don't know nothing else. You've never been a student of higher learning until we came to what was revealed to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I don't care what nobody says out there about trying to, you know, brother told me in a meeting I had right here, well, I, I can't advise black people not to carry guns. I said, all right. But look at the guns that we already carry and what we're doing with them. Show me, show me one oppressor that's even been shot at with the guns that we have. But I can show you thousands of us that are in the graveyard right now because we're carrying guns. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, neither the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is an idiot. And I told him 40 years ago, I was told I couldn't have no gun. So I said, so I walked into strong, I live under strong gun legislation. You, 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 they didn't say, well, we'll do a background check on you or something like that. If I got a gun, I'm out of here. I could not walk with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan if I have a gun in the Nation of Islam. I can't be in this house with a gun. Are you following? That's strong gun legislation. And we don't have a reason to carry a gun, especially in the state and the condition that we are in. We've been stripped. When our history was taken, we were stripped of the right model to live under. We don't even really know how to treat our women. And they can't really teach us the proper way. That's why they got to have a class to see who they really are. They have to undergo treatment from God. So it's called Muslim girls training. Oh, well, you can't call me a girl. I'm 50 years old. I'm a woman. No, you're God's little girl, the minister said. God wants to bring his daughter up right so she knows what to look for in a man. Hell, we, this is our problem. We want to tell God what ought to be done. Mm. So we have to move toward mastering our own circumstances. Unfortunately, the only real history we have of a people who in the worst condition no knowledge of who they are don't know how to treat each other. Bodies riddled with disease. That shows you no health care plan. Denied everything and made to live off of the earth. Only one lived like that was Yaqub's children. After we ran them out into the caves and hillsides of Europe, there was no program set up to support them. Am I lying? 
So after they had descended all the way down to the level of the beast, then we sent Musa. Yes, sir. Come on now. Yes, sir. And Musa came with divine knowledge, right? He revealed the Torah. Hmm. And what did they do? Did they run and go somewhere else looking for paradise? No. They took the caves and the hillsides of Europe. And the messenger said, first you start seeing small little enclaves, villages. Then they built towns. They ultimately built cities and countries. And Europe became an established continent. What does that show you? They took their own neighborhood and made it a decent place to live from Revelation. Why are we giving that history? Because we trying to move here and save our little money. And as soon as we get there, like Malcolm says, mixed for a period of time, then pretty soon they're gone and you right there all by yourself again. There goes the community again. You starting over at 60 with a new house. You done paid the one off you had many times over. But you, can't, you just can't bear to live around there no more because we're killing each other. We, we got the worst stores, the worst product, and everything sitting around us and that. And we're far from mastering our own set of circumstances. You all hearing me? Yes, sir. Yeah. And nobody else can do this but us. We have the highest number right now of out of wedlock births. So we, we, we're not getting married the way we used to. We're not staying married the way we used to, right? But we're still making babies. But the conditions that we're making them under, they're out of wedlock births. So the woman's pushing a stroller and she's got the baby but there's no man in her life that made that baby with her. Are you all, you, you, you understand? And, and they set laws up that because both of you are poor, and you know it's poor because he's probably a high school dropout, so he's, he's limited in what kind of dollar he can command. They said, we'll help you, and the government will be your man as far as giving you a little money so you can get food and different things, the government will be your man. But if your man come and live in the house with you, we got to cut you off. So the law is set up so that it can be a female-headed household. For as long as that child stays alive, it's a female-headed household. And the man that she has can never come there and build a life with her and his own child. Just because people are poor don't stop them from having babies. But you would do better to, to help them as one family unit to be able to stay together. White folks were poor. White folks were illiterate that they brought here from Europe. I don't have time to show you, but they used to have a four cent stamp back when the postage stamp called the Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act, even Dr. King has to bring it up. They brought white folks here. Not only did they not have money, they were concerned about the number of black folks, and they wanted to have one white person for every so many black people. It was called the Diversity Act. See, right now, we're talking about diversity and inclusion. Hell, they already done done diversity. And the Diversity Act was to get more white folks to oversee our growing numbers. But they had to have somewhere to live, so they called it the Homestead Act. And they gave each one something like 250 or more acres of land and money to build a house and teachers to teach them how to cultivate the land to grow food for themselves. After World War II, they came up with the GI Bill. I mean, only a handful of black people got money from the GI Bill. The white boys, and I'm, look, I'm not mad at them for looking out for their own. But we better know that they're not looking out for you or I. And if we don't look out for ourselves, God help us. So 
to close that point out, they've done things that make sense for them, give money. But now you have government saying, why should we be giving these black folks money to do something? They're only going to ruin themselves. Based on the condition that we in, they're absolutely right. That's why we have to have even reparations uh, organized. Um, the first girl, um, I forget her name, that they got on the bus down there in Montgomery, Alabama. Remember, she had a child out of wedlock. And Dr. King and them saw we can't use her for not giving up a seat to a white man because the first thing they'll do is show this baby out of wedlock and shows she out of control anyway. That's why we need to control them and get them away from the white woman and sit them in the back of the bus. So Rosa Parks had to go get on the bus. And see, the white folks that were ignorant, they set up, they came up with a new idea. Because they came from an old civilization. Only if you were rich and royal were you educated. If you weren't, you never got an education. So they came up with an idea called public education. Read the history of Horace Mann and others, and you'll see that they set up public schools basically for the immigrant whites that came over. We only got into public schools at the tail end of it. Once, once most of the classrooms were black filled, they start dumbing down the education. But you had young black men learning how to build engines for airplanes. And anybody that went to school in the, in the 50s or 60s, I mean, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is the product, not of the public schools, but of one of the best schools in the country, and that was that Latin, Boys Latin. Oh, God. Well, anyway, God is power and force. Yes, sir. Now, look at this. They come up with a constitution, but the minister calls them hypocrites. He says, so the hypocrites, they amended a piece of paper leaving black men and women colored with the blood of slavery. Nobody amended our condition. You can amend a piece of paper, but if you don't amend people's condition, they can't take advantage of it. Nobody amended our condition, and because nobody amended our condition, we have not been able to take advantage of this document called the Constitution. See, white folks are saying, well, they're all free. I heard a white woman say, you got Obama in the White House. Let's get real, she said. What's the problem? Huh? I'm just telling you the way they think. This was, she wasn't trying to be mean. She's trying to figure it out. And we can't give her an answer because we haven't figured it out. So, you know... I mean, you can kill the brain deoxidizing it. Look at the, what the minister says finally. They will never receive you until you are wise enough to receive yourself. They will never respect you until you are intelligent enough to show self-respect. We've been watching the series on the first ladies uh, that on Showtime. And they showed Michelle Obama as a girl wanting to go to an Ivy League college and how the um, school counselor was trying to encourage her not to go but to find some other college, not Princeton, not Harvard. And she said, you should, we should be able to go to these schools without being an athlete, right. getting a scholarship, because her brother had gotten a scholarship based on his athletic ability. She was just smart, and that should be enough to get you in these schools. And so she defied the counselor and, of course, overrode that, and the rest is history. She's one of the most brilliant of, of what you call the first ladies that the White House has ever had. But I'm trying to show you, as late as the time of the Obamas, they still trying to use the same old trick they used on Malcolm X and the minister, discourage you from going on to higher learning. Ain't nobody gonna accept you till you accept yourself. The Staples Singers made a popular record. Respect yourself. Come on, come on. And until you do that, ain't nobody gonna give a hoot about you. They'll never, 
He, you have to be intelligent enough to show self-respect. And watch this. You cannot show self-respect in a vacuum. Self-respect comes from knowledge of self, which makes you see yourself as you are. Then you can expect from yourself what you should. So, I, you know, I close with that movie because this man made this machine and you know how he um, made himself go from, he was trying to get from one chamber, his body would sort of disintegrate, break down, and it would re-put itself back together again in the next chamber called the fly. And see, he said, uh, just think, follow me for a minute, because a man's in an old world trying to get to a new one. And it, the, the transformation has to take place. It's not a reforming. It's a transforming. So finally, he, he's using other creatures, other objects, and everything. Finally, he uses himself to go through the chamber. When he gets to the other side, look like everything is all right. He kept going through. What he didn't realize was that when he went through with himself, a fly got caught in the thing. So not only did he break down, but the fly broke down. And when it came time to restore him and bring him back together, it restored the fly, but the fly was in him. Now, the only evidence he had, because he looked the same. Yes, sir. Just like people that believe they look the same. Come on, come on. Judas wasn't a traitor when they brought him into the fold. Come on. When Judas came in, he was a believer. Oh, yeah. But something happened to him yeah. on the way. Oh. Huh? This is what's happening to the black movements and that. That's why we can't get ourselves together, whether it's South Street, Broad Street, or whatever. Come on, come on. Hey. Every time we try to do something that can help us undergo a change, we don't realize what's in the chamber with us. Hey. Something in us that needs to be destroyed. Come on. Because if we grow, it'll grow. Yeah. So he gets to the other side. Next thing you know, he eating Krispy Kreme donuts for dinner. What does that tell you? His appetite's done changed. Are your appetites for truth and justice still the same as they were from the day you joined with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan? Is there? Because the minister said the appetite is not the same if you're no longer concerned with what's happening to our people beyond the walls of the mosque. Yes, what's happening to us in the diminishing of our wealth? What's happening to us in our children murdering each other? What's happening to us as the crime wave is showing itself more manifest in our communities than any other, making us uh, associate crime with black skin? The more you associate crime with black skin, I don't care if you are unarmed. The police don't give a damn about that. Your black skin right. is a weapon right. in his mindset. Yes, so if the appetite to see our people change as a result of this truth. See, when Jesus preached at the Mount of Olives, the Bible says, when the wise heard him preach, they wanted to kill him. Come on, come on. And in the very next verse, after it says they wanted to kill him, what did it say? They feared the people. His magnetic pull on the people, because Jesus kept his house full, that was the best security. Because they said so many people willing to listen to him, but when your house is empty, the enemy is encouraged. He ain't going to win, but he's encouraged yes. to think. When you open the book COINTELPRO, Mr. Hoover warns all the field agents, don't attack Muhammad's temples. He said because they're overflowing, crowded with, our, with their people, and as long as the people are in there, 
It's a threat to national security. Just, just, just think this over. But see, the people coming out in large amounts, they got to be an appetite for that. So this man, his appetite started changing. The more the fly grew, the more hideous he became. See, we got to stay plugged in what the minister calls truth and right guidance. Because in the study, guys, it says God starts off like a seed in the mind. But when you're feeding on truth and right guidance, it grows into his mind. Yes, sir. The more it grows into his mind, I mean, ignorance is destroyed, so love is increased. Right. Yes, sir. Because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said the enemy's aim was to destroy the natural love. And that love comes from knowledge. We, we cannot afford to cut ourselves off now. We've really got to understand so that we don't go out and try these failed methods to stop our people from killing each other. Uh, they, they done tried money. They done tried, well, we, we from the hood. We know how they think. We know what they do. They done tried going to the prison. They done tried everything. But let me tell you something. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, if you're not unalike, you don't even attract them. Come on. And when it comes to our city, we had an opportunity. When Captain Dennis came here, and many said, well, we'll come on board, and we were going to start the training. Right. Come on. Because the minister finally said, yeah, let the groups go out, but they should all be trained by the FOI. Right. You don't have to join the temple, but the FOI are willing to train you. Right. That's not because we think we're the big poopa or something like that. Yes, God came. And trained a messenger who could have been nursed in self-hatred. God came. And the two of them have prepared a general for us and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. God has come. And because God came, there's no devil that can take down the one that God put up before us today. He is the officer of the day. As long as Farrakhan is the officer of the day, I don't want to hear about no other officer. That's right. He's connected with the commanding officer. Yes, is that right? That's right? I'm not. I never talk with God. I never talk with God's Christ. I'm a non-commissioned officer of the guard. That's the way I'm going into the streets. You go like you want to. But they already on my phone want to engage me. I'm already engaged. Shit, you are, you under management of some people out there and want me to get up under what you under? Hell, he's failing, you failing. Yes, I'll be engaged, but I'm taking the program of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm holding up the banner of Louis Farrakhan. Huh? You are not going to drop him and tell me you're going to stop the crime on the street. You're a criminal facilitator when you deny God's messenger today in the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you for listening. I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. Allah. Let's give him another round of applause, our Delaware Valley Student Regional Minister, Minister Rodney Muhammad. Boy, and all the fallen humanity, just by show of hands, may I see your hands? Well, if you are out for your first or second time, and you believe that what you heard today is true, and you would like to come just based on as a bearer of witness of what you just heard, and join on to your own, I can't say really join, but just get your name put back in the book of life, would you be willing to come forward and shake the man's hand who brought you that wonderful message and stimulated the cells in your brain to make you awake and aware of some things that you might not have known? Would you be willing to do that today? On, Any, on, my sister, my brother, would you be? Don't be ashamed. We can't force you to do that. Do it. But if you would like to come up, Brother Rodney, if you, yeah, they're going to come up, Brother Rodney. Here you are. You'd like the mic, sir? Here you are, Ms. Rodney. Here you are. 
This is Brother Sherrod. I think I've been seeing him. This is not your first time here, right? No, sir. Man, I'm so happy to see you, bro beloved. Yes, sir. C can I ask how old you are? 16. 16 oh, years man. of age. This young black man here to listen to. See, we don't have a adult teaching and kitty teaching. Same teaching for everybody, right? Because we're all equipped to handle and achieve and accomplish the, the said above, right? A new high civilization. Brother Sherrod, let's give him another round of applause. See, Brother David, how you doing, ma'am? What's your name? Shanice. Sister Shanice. Is this your first time out with us? My second time. This is her second time, Sister Shanice. She's out with us today. Come on, show us some love. Give her a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you for being out with us. All right. Yes, sir, black man. How you doing? What's your name, sir? Ja'Kai Lewis. I'm already looking up to you. Say it again. Ja'Kai Lewis. Yes, yes. You know who he looks like in the face to me? It reminded me of Muhammad Ali. Go ahead. Didn't he? Go ahead. Go ahead. Wow. Boy, this is, this is great. This is great. Well, you know, you all are young people, but there's so much road to travel. And you all got a lot to do for us. We hate to throw this heavy burden on you, but you know what we found out? Your shoulders are strong enough to carry this weight, you know? So thank you very much for being out. Come on, let's give them all a big round of applause. Hey, now. Praise be to Allah. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you, dear family, for coming forward and shaking our student regional minister's hand um, in doing so. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So let's move right along. Your time has been well spent. Uh, our time has been well spent. Let's move to the next aspect of our meeting, which is our charity, and we'll do this. Helping his man in our midst, which is the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, which is his extension here, the uh, brother of student minister Rodney Muhammad. So anytime we help to keep the facility open so that we can keep this life-giving teaching coming to you, there's a reward for you just in doing that. So how many today would be willing to donate $1,000, $100, 50 Any of those out here today? I see Brother Divine, hand goes right up. He's got today, what's he giving? 125. 125, coming from Brother Divine. Give him a round of applause. Praise be to Allah. Is there anyone else? $100, $50, $125. Well, is there another $125 out there today? We'll have righteous competition. That's beautiful. But if not, if you have $125, $100, $50. Any $50 donators, $100 donators today, hands. I'm looking, I see a lot of wonderful looks, beautiful faces, praise be to Allah. I want to see some hands going up, and we can move right along, dear family. Any other $100, I'm coming to your number in just a moment. $50 is on the table. $20 donators, any $20 donators today? Anyone? I have Brother Michael, he throws his hand up. Brother Michael has $20, give him a round of applause. Is there anyone else? $20. $50, $20, $50. I see another hand goes up back here. Our brother's raising his hand. Yes, sir. Brother Damir, $20. Brother Damir, $20. Thank you, Brother Damir. Praise be to Allah. Give him a round of applause. Don't be mad at him. They're giving in charity. They're going to get that reward. Yes, ma'am. Sister Alexia, $20. Thank you, Sister Alexia. Praise is due to Allah. Anyone else? $20. I'm coming to your number. Coming to your number. $20. Yes, sir. Brother Nas. Brother David, student in the ministry, our brother David, $100. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, brother David. Praise be to Allah. Anyone else? $100, $50, $20. Any $10 donators today? Anyone with $10 who would like to help with the ministry of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in the Delaware Valley region at this time? $20, $50, $100, $10 is on the floor. We're looking, we're looking. Anyone else? Don't be ashamed. You're going to get it back. I see Brother Calvin pointing at somebody. A hand is going out. Our sister right here. Queen. Yes, indeed. Sister Mary, $20. Sister Mary gives $20. Thank you, Sister Mary. All praise is due to Allah. Anyone else? 20, 10, 50. If not, let's pass the receptacles, dear family, at this time. And whatever you have to give, uh, please put it in the receptacles at this time. I know a lot of us has already paid online. Those who are believers, some have already gone back to the tables. All praise is due to Allah, but this is our public collection. You'll close out. Okay. So one thing before I leave from up here, thank you all who gave. Thank you all for giving with your time. Um, and uh, as that is also charity 
and we thank you for sharing it today. Just one thing I'm going to make mention of this. Here's a book that we have here um, on sale. It's by the Student National Secretary of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, Brother Saad Ali Muhammad. It is her, his new book called Nahum. We have that in the back at the uh, Window Cafe. You can pick this up. There's also food items that are available for sale today in the same location. But here's our brother's book. It's $20. Pick it up at the table. Get something to eat. Go home. Read it. Have a good time with what our brother has shared with us uh, in his book. So at this time, I want to bring back to this rostrum uh, student minister, Rodney Muhammad. Give him a round of applause, dear family. Salam alaikum. Okay. Uh, all right. So before we close out in prayer, I just wanted to apologize to you all. I'm, I'm so fired up. I didn't mean to curse. But let me tell you something. I'm, 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 I'm not as angry at the people that's doing the killing than the people that's calling me up who know they have rejected the minister, but they want to use his followers. I just think that's an insult. Uh, I'm not taking it. I'm going to drive a harder line with them. Uh, I'm not going to be too kind yes, with them. You can reject me, but when you reject him, you bring something out of me uh, that I lose my tolerance for you. Um, so I don't care who you are, what Massachusetts or church you belong to. You have rejected the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, and you made uh, in Philadelphia not to feel it, but if you want me around you, you're going to feel it. Yes. I know you have rejected him, uh, and you don't want his way or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's way, you know, and I get it that everybody theologically has a path they follow, and you should be allowed to follow that, but I haven't rejected Prophet Muhammad. No, sir. I haven't rejected Warf Dean Muhammad. No, sir. I haven't rejected uh, any of the Christian pastors or anything, so why the hell should you reject my leader and teacher, and I'm supposed to sit up here and retolerate. Hell no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing that, but I, that's still no justification for me to use the rostrum that's set up for saving lives, the curse, all right? So let's stand for closing prayer. With our heads bowed, let us pray. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment, thee that we serve, thee that we beseech for aid, guide us on the straight path, the path of those to whom thou hast bestowed favor, not of those to whom wrath is brought down, nor those who go astray. Say, he, Allah, is one. Allah is he of whom we all depend. He neither begets nor is he begotten. And there is none like him, and I bear witness that none or nothing deserves to be served or worship besides Allah, who came to us in the person of Master Fahd Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. We forever thank him for the great Mahdi, the Christ, the exalted Christ, and we thank you for your student, servant, and apostle, our leader, teacher, and guide, a Messiah to us today, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In their names we pray, I mean. Thank you again, brothers and sisters, for being out. The Lord blessed us and held the rain up for a little while.